Hey folks, welcome back. This is Nick with your complete guide to the line of battle game system and today we're going to focus on line of sight. I'm actually sitting here lamenting my sorrows with a Bloody Mary. I was expecting to receive to take Washington today. This is the pre-order from Multiman Publishing for the Battles of Monocacy and Fort Stevens. I got the shipping notification on Thursday. Typically, it's a two-day shipping point to Indiana. Uh, I actually saw the USPS lady just drive by, so I'm a little depressed. The girlfriend was out of the house. I had the table cleared. I was ready to rock and roll. Had my uh, clippers out, but it's not to be. So I'll probably be seeing that early next week, probably give you guys a video or two. I've really never been super excited to get a game and get it right on the table, but I am for it to take Washington. So at least we're shipping, folks. We got that to the pre-order level. Cool. Uh, but back to this, line of sight is what I want to talk about today. We've had a lot of people posting some things on some of the other videos, some comments. There's been a lot of talk on Consum World and Board Game Geek about line of sight, and I want to kind of cover some of the basics. I'm going to do the best I possibly can to be as clear as I possibly can in some of these. Um, this system uses line of sight rules that are very unique. They're not something where you have uh, center points and hexes where you're stringing line of sight like that. Uh, this is definitely a unique system, but I really think it's intuitive. It's easy once you understand it. Uh, and as you'll notice here, I've kind of got pulled up, zoomed in on the rules, this section. There's actually a little comment right here that says players are basically going to be urged to eyeball it. And once you feel comfortable with the basics, you should be able to do that. Uh, I need to go let the dog outside. She's freaking out. There must be a squirrel. So we'll be right back. We'll pull up the map and we'll get started. Okay, so we're going to start by reading a couple paragraphs right here in the rule book. These are the version 2 rules. We're in 4.0 line of sight. So firing and target units are always assumed to be on the highest height in their hex, but within that constraint, the firing player decides the unit's exact location within its hex for LOS purposes for a shot. The non-moving player does so in closing roll situations. This is a key component to how line of sight works in line of battle. Um, you're going to be physically choosing points within the hex. Let me show you this on the map, for example. Uh, let's say I have an infantry unit that is sitting in this hex right here. This unit, per the rules, is always going to be assumed to be on the highest location in the hex. So, in this instance, we have a crest line running through that hex. This is going to be a higher elevation than this elevation. So the unit that would be located, either firing or being targeted, that's in this hex, has to physically be on this crest line. Which means when we string LOS later, we choose that as either anywhere on there is our start point, or that has to be the end point if we're targeting that location. Hopefully I'm making that as clear as possible. Another example. Uh, let's take a look at where we actually have some units. So I do have a scenario pulled up here. <laughs> let's say we're looking at this guy over here. So Cable, Carlton's battery and Cable. If we hide these counters, we'll notice that this is a higher elevation, this is a lower elevation. If Cable decides that he's going to have his artillery fire from here, he has to be located when he strings line of sight starting in that higher elevation. He cannot do it from this lower elevation. These are important concepts. Okay? Capiche. Only crests modify the height level of endpoints. So as you saw in that first example, I had to string either off of the crest or to the crest. Endpoints are categorized as higher or lower based on that height level. Okay? <laughs> Potential obstacles between the two endpoints that lie under the LOS line apply a number of modifiers to their level in determining if they block LOS. Its modified height level is called the obstacle height. So, um, here you'll see that these are going to be our 
height levels for the obstacles. Um, any crest line is always going to be a plus one height obstacle. Woods is going to be a plus three, orchards are plus one, towns are plus two, and as up there, crests are plus one. So if we go back to this, let's take a look at some examples here. Let me pull a couple units just so that we have some guys and let's get out of um, all these other units so we can go up here so it's explicitly clear. And we can take a look at some examples. So one thing you'll notice too with these maps is some people have a difficult time determining which elevations are higher than other, other elevations. I understand and I agree with the fact that yes, a lot of these colors for the elevations are very similar. Um, the best thing that you can do is going to be to look at where the runs are at. So you'll notice that there's a run right there, there's a run right there. Those are always going to be your lower elevations and just work out from there. So if you're confused, is this a sinkhole over here or is this a little knoll? Well, you have a run that's going kind of around it. That's going to be your lower elevation 99% of the time. So we can go up, okay, this is another elevation, another elevation, another elevation. So this is the higher elevation. Um, not to get too off track there. But that's a little trick that you can use. So if we're looking at just a basic simple line of sight from what we just read, let's take a look at this. We have the 11th Alabama and these sharpshooters. Let's say this 11th Alabama wants to fire at these sharpshooters. Well, if we look at this hex that the 11th Alabama is in, you'll notice that it looks like it's all one terrain type but there is just a sliver of higher elevation in that hex. So when he fires, he's going to have to fire from that location in the hex because he's always going to be considered to be on the higher elevation. Now that's a very, very, very small sliver, and that's, I think, a lot of where people get confused is, does that count? Yes, it counts. If you can see it and you know that there's a higher elevation in there, you have to string it from that location. Likewise, our target is also going to be considered to be on this little sliver of elevation right here. So when we would go to string this, we would take it from there to there. Now, technically, they can't even see each other because of this crest line. So this obstacle is in the way. That's a plus one obstacle height. These guys are on the same elevation, but that crest line is going to block. Now, if the 11th Alabama were here, Obviously, they're adjacent, so they're going to be able to see each other. Um, but then he would be considered to be on that crest line. So when he strings it, he would string from the crest to there. And he could string from there to there. He can make it work however he wants. This comes in handy when you're taking long-range artillery shots uh, because you're going to be able to choose your... You can kind of maneuver yourself around woods if you're stringing your line of sight properly. So if we look at another example, we talked about the heights. Um, so for instance, let's put this guy here, and let's put this guy here. So let us pretend that the sharpshooters want to try to take a shot at the 11th Alabama. So he's going to be on the highest elevation in the hex, which is going to put him up here. And this unit's going to be on one, two levels of elevation lower. So if he strings it, he's got to go from that higher elevation. Anywhere he goes, you'll notice that that LOS string is going to go through some woods that are not in the firing unit's hex. Those woods are going to be a plus three terrain obstacle. So because this infantry unit is two elevations below, I know they're not going to be able to see because those woods are right in front of that firing unit. One thing that's important to keep in mind is that the woods or could be um, some other terrain feature within the target or firing hex do not inhibit the line of sight. So if this uh, sharpshooter unit is located here, he's going to be considered to be on this little sliver of high elevation, and he decides to fire at this unit, that is a legal shot because he is going to ignore the woods that are on those lower elevations within his hex. 
The same is going to be true for the reciprocal. The 11th Alabama is going to be able to fire into that hex and hit that guy because the terrain within the target hex is going to be ignored. So it goes through and he's going to have to string it to that highest elevation. I believe that's in the rules. Yes, yeah, so if we take a look in the rules, you'll notice this sentence right here. Nothing in either endpoint hex can be designated as an obstacle inclusive of their hex sides. Boom. Crystal clear. Um, another important thing to note with line of sight is that for ranges of four or less, anything on the line of sight that isn't ignored because of same hill is going to be blocked. Um, we're going to talk about same hill here shortly, but that could include other infantry units directly in front of you. Uh, so you're not going to be able to be behind another infantry unit if you're on the same elevation and fire through them. You're not going to be allowed to do that. Uh, for ranges of five or more, we're going to be using the slope table to determine if line of sight is blocked. And that's something that we'll talk about as well here shortly. Same hill. What is same hill? This is a very important concept in the system. It definitely warrants being covered. So let's read it here. Ignore all unmodified heights on the descending slope of the hill containing the higher endpoint. Ignore any ripples of raw elevation that might exist on that slope. Terminate this same hill when the ground begins to rise for another different hill or there is a modified height. I don't think there's supposed to be a comma in between different and hill. Use common sense here. So this rule confused me. Uh, it took me a while to actually understand it, and I don't necessarily like the way it is worded. Uh, and I wish there were maybe some other examples. So let's go over it. As far as I understand it, what same hill is trying to help us portray is that these are gently sloping hills. Do not picture these maps as being cake layers, like something where you might see an ASL. This unit right over here, the 55th New York B, is not going to be able to hide itself underneath this elevation change. These are not crests. These are just slight elevation increases. What same hill is telling us is that from the higher elevation down to this elevation, that's always going to be clear from any higher to lower elevation as long as you're going at the same elevation or to a lower elevation with no obstacles. If this cav unit were here, uh, does this guy have range? What's a C? So he doesn't have range, but let's say he did. He didn't have range at the other place either. If he's stringing it from this crest line down to him, that's always going to be clear. Uh, the way, let's use my artistic ability here. What same hill, in my opinion, is portraying is basically the hill looks like this. So I'm here, and you're here, and I'm firing down at you. This could be one elevation increase two elevation, or decrease, one elevation, decrease, two elevation, decrease, three elevation, decrease. You're not going to be able to hide behind this. So we're not going, there's an elevation, there's an elevation, there's an elevation. You're hiding underneath that elevation so I can't see you. That is not the case here. What is going to throw same hill off keel is when you hit a sequence in your line of sight where you're going to be going up in elevation. So let's say this cab unit is going to fire at the 5th Alabama battalion here. So he's carbines. I understand that. Technically, he doesn't have range. This is just an example. If he's stringing his line of sight, he's going to take it from his highest endpoint over to this guy. We'll notice that we go down in elevation, down in elevation, but then we go back up in elevation. So in this case, same hill does not apply because there is some undulation to the terrain here. So in this instance, this unit will have this terrain feature as a potential obstacle. So when we kind of look at my cool drawing for that, we can show that he's going down in elevation, down in elevation, but then there's another elevation, and then down in elevation. So this unit is somewhere in here, while we're firing from here. So this obstacle in between, where we went up in elevation, has the potential to block the line of sight. Now, because we're at range 4, 
it's automatically blocked. If we were at range 5, we would need to use the slope table. So if we pull up the rules again, let's just make sure that we read that sentence again. Um, for ranges of 4 or less, if anything is on the LOS that isn't ignored because of same hill, the LOS is blocked. So we don't ignore that because same hill does not apply. So our line of sight is going to be blocked. Um, is there anything on here that we want to talk about? Okay, so I think when we talked about artillery, we talked about danger close. If you're firing artillery at five hexes or more and you inflict some sort of result, if you have an adjacent friendly unit to that target unit, then that friendly unit is going to have to potentially, uh, well not potentially, they are going to have to basically take the same result that the target unit did. Normally you don't want to do that, so something to keep in mind. Uh, units in LOS, units only block if the range is four or less, so if you have an artillery unit, we might have covered this in artillery as well, say this artillery unit is here and this infantry unit is here and we've got a confederate unit here that artillery unit can't see that confederate infantry unit if that unit is there he's at range one two three four five he's going to be able to fire over this unit uh, that is, I got all my things here. So that's going to be this location right here. Okay, so let's go ahead and let's move to. Oh, this is also important to note here, too. Uh, open order capable units of both sides will never block LOS. So they can kind of be out in front. You can use them to screen, to skirmish, to do what they need to do. They're never going to get in the way. So. That's important to note. Let's set up some slope table examples here. Okay, so we're going to talk about the slope table now. This is 4.1 section in the rules. You're going to be using this when you're taking shots that are at range 5 or more. Typically, and let me stress this, you do not want to use the slope table all the time. It's a little bit cumbersome. It's kind of confusing. It gives you legitimate, as far as I understand it, I think it's like actual slopes. Um, and let's pull that up here so we can see it. Uh, I bet you I can get it bigger. Here we go. This is what the slope table looks like. What you're going to have is a difference in um, hexes. So range is going to be your top and difference in elevations is going to be on the left. Basically what we're going to be doing is determining what's the difference in the slope from our firing unit to our target unit, and what's the difference in slope from any intervening obstacles to our target unit. If that obstacle slope is higher than our overall slope, then the line of sight is going to be blocked. Confusing somewhat, yes. This is why I said you don't want to use this thing all the time. Once you start to understand it, though, you won't need it. And you'll just be able to eyeball it and say, okay, he can't see it. It's, in my opinion, much more satisfying to play this series if you do not stress these line of sight issues at long ranges. Most of them are going to be probably high odds or low odds, low odds, excuse me, low odds shots anyways. So either just... Take it and assume you can see, or don't take it and don't assume that you can see. Whatever. It doesn't really matter. In the big scheme of things, you're going to have so many units, it probably doesn't matter. Um, but let's look at some examples here. So let's say that Gibbs is going to be firing at some of these infantry units that are attacking. So we string it. We can see that he's at range 10. We can also see that that line of sight is going to be crossing some terrain features. So there's an increase in elevation here and there's also an orchard on that increase in elevation. So if we look at the elevations that our target and our firing units are on, we can find the difference. So he's on level one, level two, level three, level four. Gibbs is gonna be on level five. 
So that means our firing and our target unit have four differential between their levels. Now when I had that string up there, I could see that the overall range was going to be 10 hexes. So if I pull this up, we can say, okay, our range is going to be 10 hexes, and we have four differential in height. So if we find this on the matrix here, that's going to give our overall slope as a 4. So the decrease in slope is going to be a 4. Now we need to see what's the slope from this obstacle to our target unit. If that slope is steeper, then this unit is assumed to be covered behind this obstacle here. So in order to do that, we would do the same general idea. So he's on level 1. This terrain elevation is level 2. And the orchard is a plus 1, so that's going to be a level 3 obstacle. So the differential is going to be 2. And we're at 1, 2, 3, 4 range. We could pull up our handy dandy slope table. We'll see that we are at 4 range with a 2 differential, which is going to give us a slope, an obstacle slope of 5. The obstacle slope is higher than the overall slope, which means we're blocked. So that shot could not happen. Um, if we go to my cool little paint examples, so he's going down, he's going down, there's that little dip in elevation, and then it goes back down, that target unit is here, we're firing from way up here, and those orchards kind of come up, so when we try to take that shot, boom, we're just barely blocked. Um, so that's basically what we're representing here. Let us take a look at another example. So on to our next example. Let's say that Gibbs wants to fire at the 56th Virginia. So we string it, endpoint to endpoint. Going to be range 8. And let's find our differential in hex heights, or elevation heights. So he's gone level 2, level 3, level 4, level 5. So we have three differentials. So if we pull up our slope table, we can say range is 8. 3 differential. Our overall slope is a 4. So what's our obstacle height? So this obstacle is actually going to be on a lower elevation, so that's not the obstacle you're going to you're, bleh, use. Um, the 56 Virginia is not going to be affected by these orchards on a lower elevation. However, these orchards are still the ones that are going to cause us issues. So he's at range 2. And because he's on the same elevation as where those orchards originate, the difference is only going to be 1 in levels. So if we pull this up, we'll notice that we're at range 2 with a difference of 1. Our obstacle height, once again, is going to be 5. So 5 is greater than 4. The line of sight is blocked. Let's say that Gibbs is going to be firing at the 18th Virginia back there. So in this instance, we're going through the same obstacle, and the only difference is going to be the obstacle slope. So instead of being at 2 range, we're now going to be at 3. If we pull that up, we can see that the additional range is going to give our obstacle slope a 3. Now our overall slope was a 4, so he's going to be able to be seen. He's not close enough to those orchards to be screened by them. Um, and you'll, you'll kind of get a feel for this. Like I said, once you start playing around with it, I mean, if he's here, he's going to be down in elevation. These guys are going to have a longer shadow behind these obstacles. The higher he gets, if he's up here, he's going to be on that crest line he'd actually be at level 6. That's going to be even better. He's going to have a steeper angle. These guys are going to have less of a shadow behind these obstacles. So the slope table takes a little bit of time to get used to using it. Once you do, you can figure out your slopes pretty quickly. Uh, I find that if I find out what one slope is going to be, or if I can see a unit, I can kind of figure out if I can see other units in the general vicinity based on what I see on that slope determination. Let's talk about orchards while we're right here, too. If we pull orchards up in the rules, the, they are 
a little bit special. Uh, 4.2D orchards, they say ignore the entirety of any orchard that is all or in part in an endpoint hex. Use the boundary around the orchard symbols to determine the orchard's extent. So, what that's saying is this entire orchard area is considered an orchard. If this unit is firing out of or being fired at, so if the endpoint is either the target or the originating hex of the fire, then the rest of the orchard is ignored. Um, they're in the orchard, they can see out of, but they can also be fired at. Orchards really only come into play when you're firing through them. So here, neither unit is in the orchard, so that's going to be blocking terrain. If this unit is moving up, he's now considered to be in the orchard. Um, this is all going to be ignored for line of sight purposes. If he's in here, then this is all going to be ignored for line of sight purposes. He can see him. Um, if well, I guess, yeah. So that's really all there is to it. There's not really much else to talk about in regards to orchards. Uh, they're fairly simple. If you're in them, you can see out of and be seen from them. So what are some other circumstances that arise with line of sight? So one that I saw recently was posted onto, I believe, Board Game Geek, and we can cover that here just quickly. So let's pretend that these two units are aligned like this and let's find a Union Infantry unit just for the sake of using who we should. Let's say there's a Union Infantry unit right here. So the question brought up was can the firing unit, the 104th New York, if he's the firing unit, is he able to fire at the 56th Virginia? So let's actually move this example up like that so that we're all on the same elevations. The question is, is this guy going to be blocking the shot? Well, no. We talked about endpoints, and you choose the endpoints, right? So as long as we avoid this unit, then he is capable of taking that shot into there. Um, that's, people like to muddy the waters and say, oh, well, there's hex sides here, and does he cover the hex side? He's covering the hex side, so technically he can't see him. It has nothing to do with that. Just worry about your endpoints. I can fire from anywhere in the hex. If I said, oh, I'm going to fire like this, well, that's blocked. He can't take a rear shot um, because this unit is covering that particular section of the shot. It's going to have to be a frontal shot, but it can be taken anywhere into that higher elevation. So yes, that is entirely legal. Um, I think it actually got, that question got transferred over to Consum World too, and I'm pretty sure that most of the guys who frequent those forums confirmed that and concurred with the original interpretation that the line of sight is clear. Another question would be, let's say that these two guys are, this was actually the same post, so we can knock out two birds with one stone here. Let's say this is the situation, and we're going to talk, okay, is the line of sight from the 28th Virginia to the 104th New York, is it clear and is a rear shot allowed? Well. We look at the line of sight. You can string it from anywhere. Oh yeah, that's definitely a rear shot. Um, there's really, I don't know why, for some reason people like to say, oh, well, this guy's covering the hex side. Well, your shot, as long as your line of sight does not cross that hex side, it has no effect on it. Uh, this guy couldn't take a frontal shot if he wanted to because that infantry unit is blocking that side of the hex. So it's got to go through that part. Okay. So I think we've covered probably the majority of the basics of the system. You're always going to have weird situations where, let's say, you're 
on one of these little knolls and you've got a guy who's down in a gully but there's woods in the way that might be an instance where you want to use that slope table remember if you're at short ranges if there's anything on the line of sight that's an obstacle it's blocked so that makes it very simple when you're closed in tight in those situations anything else in the rules that we feel like we need to cover here um, I guess it's worth stating that you can always see your adjacent hex. Nothing will ever block if you're adjacent to a unit. The main keys that I think players should take away from line of sight, especially new players, is that the terrain is supposed to represent gentle rolling hills for the most part. Don't get stuck up on the cake layer stuff. And especially when you're firing at those long ranges, don't get worked up about the line of sight stuff. The joy of the game is being able to play out these large battles with a rule set that allows you to do that without being overbearing. Yes, it's great to have every single line of sight absolutely perfect, but in some instances, if you've got an artillery park up on Little Round Top and you got enemy guys moving through some of these areas over here behind Rosewoods or the Wheat Field or Millerstown Road. You're going to you're going to hurt your enjoyment if you slow down to take every single one of those shots by looking at the slope table. You're better off just saying, "Okay, there's an obstacle here. I'm really high up and you're pretty far behind that obstacle. I bet you I can see it." And just take it. Um and that's where I think we get back to the statement that's actually made in the rules that says players are urged to use an eyeball determination for 90% of all LOS decisions. Um, it's not going to be difficult if you're just playing for fun. Uh, I would really try to not get stuck up on the line of sight stuff. It can be confusing. It took me a while to figure it out. Um, but just like anything else, if you have intervening elevation differences, those are obviously going to block areas where I think line of sight can get difficult are obviously going to be down in here. So kind of the, uh, the scene of long streets attack on the second day of Gettysburg, you're maybe going to have some situations down there that can get a little hairy with determining whether you can see or not. I think there's some locations at Antietam that are going to be a little bit troublesome here and there, maybe around the sunken lane. I think I've seen some, some questions posed on Consum World or Board Game Geek. I would also recommend if you have to know and you can't figure it out on your own, take a snapshot or a snapshot or whatever you want to call it of your screen if you're playing on Vassal or take a picture of it and put it up on one of those forums. Consum world, there's a lot of guys on there. Dean looks at that stuff. They're going to be able to help you out. They're going to give you reasonings behind why it is the way it is. They'll help you uh, perhaps understand it a little more clearly than I can. It's somewhat difficult to just throw counters out here and say, okay, is this a good example or not? It's a lot more fluid when I'm playing because those examples and explanations kind of just come up. Um, Perhaps I'll do another playthrough video and we'll get some situations where line of sight might be a little bit hairy and we can go over them. I need to get back into doing these. Uh, obviously right now I'm just rambling. But yeah, I would recommend reaching out to those forums, seeing if people can help you out, and just try not to get hung up on it too much. All right, so I think we'll end it there. That's enough rambling for now. I'm hoping to maybe work on a video regarding orders. I think I might actually need to maybe map out and plan how I want to explain those rules. Maybe not. Maybe I'll just ramble like I do in these. Uh, but that's going to be, I think that's the other area that players, especially new players, get hung up on is how to interpret the orders what's possible within certain orders, who are orders going to, where do they originate, all those sorts of things. 
even seasoned players, even myself, I find myself asking myself, well, can I do this? Or is this legal? Or what's going on here? So I think the orders is definitely going to be the next video. Maybe, maybe I'll just do a playthrough here. I thought about maybe just running through a peach orchard scenario and just kind of playing it so that people can see the game actually in action a little bit more. I'd love to do that with to take Washington, but alas, it has not arrived yet. So, okay, one last thing here before I'm done today too. If you guys are new to these videos or new to the series, you can go back and take a look at some of the previous videos that I've made. Those will go over all the rules basics regarding movement, combat, firing, formations, the you know status counters, all that type of stuff. Go to my um, page here and also if you guys haven't ordered to take Washington obviously I'm still gonna plug it um, you know pick that up it's now out the next game in the series is going to be the wilderness which I am really looking forward to I think that's gonna be very cool and I've also submitted a game design for Perryville so we'll see what happens with that in the future obviously with Wilderness Looming, that's going to be on the back burner for quite some time. But who knows? Um, I really enjoyed messing around with it and designing it and playing it and doing some things like that. So there's a lot of buzz with the series right now. we got to keep it going strong. I think uh, to take Washington is going to re-energize it a little bit. And especially with the Wilderness coming out, it's going to be probably the only regimental level game on the battle. I think that's really going to be something unique and special, um, and I'm very much looking forward to it. So hang with it, guys. The series is doing well, I think, and uh, just keep playing, having a good time. Bye.